Hello and welcome to River City Online. We're excited that you've joined us today. And we just say please take a moment and say hi in the chat and let us know that you're here.
Hello and welcome to River City Online. We're excited that you've joined us today. And we just say, please take a moment and say hi in the chat and let us know that you're here. We hope you experience God today in a new and fresh way. Feel free to connect to your host or ask for prayer at any time during the service. And please have a great service. Jesus, Jesus, you make the 
darkness trembled, Jesus, Jesus. Hey church, it's week two of our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series. Last week we talked about the importance of knowing ourselves so that we may know God. Yeah, and this week we're going to look at the power of going back in order to go forward. And here's the truth, if we don't deal with the issues of the past and let God change us and transform us, it can have a huge negative impact on us actually walking forward into all God has for us. Joseph discovered this truth. Today we're going to look at a passage in Genesis 50 where Joseph confronts the issues of the past so that God can heal his family and redeem their future. Yeah, because God has a brilliant future for all of us and in Christ he, he takes care of those things. But we have to intentionally look at the spiritual journey we're on and take care of the difficulties and even the tragedies of the past because remember, it's impossible for us to be spiritually mature without being emotionally healthy. Everybody, Pastor Kevin here. Thanks for joining us online. We are in part two of a series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and we're looking at going back in order to go forward. We're looking at how spiritual maturity uh, and emotional maturity are intertwined. Here's a quote from Pete Scazzeri. He says, it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. We need to look at those feelings and emotions God's given us and how they impact our spiritual journey as well. And they're indicators of what God, God's doing below the surface of the iceberg. That iceberg is that what's above the surface is kind of what everybody else sees, behaviors, uh, things going on that are noticeable. But then there's this below the surface stuff, this 90% that really is impacting our lives every day. So last week we, we looked at knowing yourself so that you can know God better and that that's important. And again, that emotions and feelings are tied to that. They, we don't let them lead our lives, but certainly they're a part of the communication that God uses to help us uh, and invite us to a place of greater healing, wholeness, and blessing. And so, uh, we're going to look at our families of origin today, or we could even call it foo, all right? Your family of origin and how that impacts our spiritual journey. And so we're going we're gonna to go back in order to go forward. So let me give you a definition of family. It's on the screen for you. Entire, the entire extended family over three to four generations. That's a biblical definition of family. It's when, when the Bible refers to your family, it's it's assuming a three to four generations of family. So in our case, that'd be back to the mid to late 1800s. So that's a lot of family, that's a lot of history. Most of us can't even go back a couple generations, you know, and, and, and know who's in that lineage. So, so some can, you know, some are really into that. But the Bible talks about generational sin, generational blessing, and, and really that how it impacts us, it affects generations. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 20, right in the context of the Ten Commandments, Moses is bringing those down and sharing what God's given him to the people of Israel. And he says this in Exodus 25 to 6, he says, for the Lord, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You read that and you go, what? That's kind of harsh, isn't it? Kind of harsh. It says, I'm going to, God, this God is a jealous God, and He punishes, our God's a jealous God, He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, it sounds really harsh, and, 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 but what's interesting is in the Hebrew, that word punish there means this, and I put this on the screen. It's the cons it means consequences that repeat themselves or can repeat themselves. So what, he, what he's saying here is he's saying, listen, your sin, the sin of your family history, the difficulty, but it could also be, uh, in this case it's sin, can, can tend to be repeated and it impacts your legacy. Yeah, your, your sin, the, the, and, and listen, there's generational blessing as well, but in this case, he's talking about the sin, so it, the consequences that repeat themselves. So the principle here is what happens in one generation often repeats itself in the next. What happens in one generation often repeats itself in the next. And so, now, 
this is not uncommon. You can see this and you just think about your own family or those that you know. You can see many times there's addictive behaviors that tend to repeat themselves or there's patterns of abuse. If you know people in those situations or even in your family, marital infidelity, uh, mistrust of authority, racism, sexism, lack of emotional connection, uh, distanced, you know, people that are distanced or enmeshed, uh, traumas that tend to get repeated. Uh, you see these patterns if you look for them. And the, the point is, is it's biblical. It's right here. It's, it's saying, listen, the sins of the family can tend to get passed on and the consequences can t tend to get passed on. And so it's important that we look at this because we want to go back in order to go forward fully, right? And so we need to look at our past to go forward. And, and sometimes you might even right now go, I don't want to look at my past. I'm, I, I'm living forward. I'm living today. And I get that and I know that, but I'm going to hopefully show you today that this is important that we do this and it takes some courage, but it's worth the cur It's worth the work to go back there because there's a greater freedom, not only for you personally, but for your family and the generations to come. Your kids, your gen the, the impact of your extended family, uh, and even, uh, you know, well, who would, who would not want that? I know you want that. I do too. And so let's look at a story. I'm going to look at the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph uh, in, in Genesis, if you go to the book of Genesis is where we're going to be for a bit here. Uh, the story starts in chapter 37, but 25% of Genesis is about Joseph. As a matter of fact, last year, about this time last year in September last year, we, we were in a nine part series on Joseph. So if you're, you listen to this today and you go, man, I want to, I want to think more about Joseph. I don't want to dive in, read it, read chapter 37 to 50. But even if you want, you can tune in online. You can go and look at the website, go to media and the sermons. And right there in 2022, you'll see all the story of Joseph being unpacked in nine different messages. And so in this story, you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a history here prior to, uh, prior to Joseph. And there's blessing that's been passed on. Abraham has the Abrahamic blessing that God gives him. He says, you're going to be, you're going to be the father of many nations and there's, you'll be blessed to be a blessing that gets passed on to Isaac. Then it gets passed on to Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. This represents 12 tribes of Israel. And Joseph is one of, of those brothers and uh, what are those sons and and just as the blessing can be passed on though as we just heard in Exodus 20 also sin and can be passed on or generational troubles and challenges and difficulties and traumas happen and earthquake events happen and difficulties happen and they impact you and can impact the future. As a matter of fact, if you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's story, you can see some patterns uh, that, that were, that happened here. For instance, uh, just some patterns that were dysfunctional. Uh, there's a pattern of lying and deceit in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's story. Abraham lied about Sarah. Jacob was known as a deceiver. Joseph's brothers lie about his death. They sell him into slavery, uh, left him for dead. I mean, they were jealous. I mean, there's just like, it's bad, right? So there's lying and deceit. There's favoritism. Abraham favored Isaac. Isaac favored Esau. Jacob favored Joseph. So there was toxic kid parent dynamics happening. And, and this is the thing. <laughs> Let me just say to all of us, if you're a parent, please, love all your children. Don't be, don't have massive favorites. Okay. It really causes harm and danger to them. And in God's sight, every kid is unique and they deserve your love and affection the same. And so uh, we need to ask God to help us with that. You see not only lying and deceit and favoritism as a pattern, generational pattern in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, but also there's these cutoffs. For instance, Isaac and Ishmael were cut off. Uh, uh, Jacob and Esau, strange. Joseph cut off, was cut off from his brothers and family. So there's just these incredible harsh treatments and, and traumas in the history right there in the beginning of time in Genesis, we see this. There's also dysfunctional marriages. I mean, Abraham slept with Hagar, had a child uh, while married and his wife encouraged it, which is really twisted. And that's, and that wasn't God's will, but, but that's, they took matters into their own hands because the blessing that God promised didn't seem to be happening in their timing. And so they took matters into their own hands. And when you and I try to get ahead of God, a lot of times what happens is we sin <laughs> and we do it our way, which brings problems. And we see some problems that came as a result. Isaac had a really sketchy relationship with his wife. Jacob had two wives and two concubines or two girlfriends, basically in the same household. So you got two wives and two concubines and you want life to be normal. It's a setup and a recipe for, for dysfunction and trouble. And so the Bible's really clear that, and I love, this is one of the things I love about the Bible, there is no such thing as a perfect family. 
<laughs> like, we, if you were raised by Jesus only, then you maybe would have a perfect family. But you and I, none of us, no matter how good a family you grew up in, it's not perfect. So it gets messy. It gets messy back there. And especially if you start going back three to four generations, right? Why? Because we live in a broken, sinful world and we're humans and we're battling the flesh, the world and the devil. And, and, and God's, you know, sent Jesus to redeem us. But we still have to say yes to that. We still have to receive that gift. And prior to that, man, you know, it, it's, it's just hard. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle because the enemy of our souls, is, his job description is kill, steal, and destroy. And he doesn't want you and I walking in the freedom that God had or in our original design back, back to the garden in a sense with no, none of that. So we're, we're enmeshed in all this and, and it's difficult. And yet Christ does a great work for us. So let's look at this, really this multi-generational transmission process that, I, I won't even mention this, that Murray Bowen, uh, who, who is a part of Family Systems Therapy, she, uh, a you know, famous secular counselor, uh, talks about this tendency for generational things to be passed on. As a matter of fact, there's been large studies done, for instance, there was a large study done on the Holocaust victims and the trauma that they experienced. And those Holocaust victims that didn't do the inner work to get healed and free, tended to pass on their trauma to their children and those children to their next, to their children. And so the ones who didn't do the work, that trauma that they went through not, didn't just impact them, it impacted generation after generation. And so you see this pattern, but the good news is we can, we can in Christ break that pattern. <laughs> yes, that's why we're talking about this because we wanna go back to go forward, right? And so let's look at the story of Joseph a little bit this morning and, and uh, today, and, and let's look at this. Genesis 50, uh, 15 to 17 on the screen says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. No, so, 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 so obviously this is the end of Genesis, Genesis 50. The story starts in 37 where Joseph's a teenager, his father, he's his father's favorite. He gets the coat of many colors. His brothers were jealous because they didn't, J Jacob, their dad didn't spend as much time with them. He didn't look at them the same. Anyway, it was bad. It was bad. And so, and then Joseph, God gives him a dream and he tells all, he, in his immaturity, he tells the dream to his family and they're all like, what? You're going to, there's a part of the dream where they're going to bow down to him, where they bow down to him. And he tells them that. And they're like, they already didn't like him, but then they really got angry with him and upset with him. And so, so they reject him. They throw him in a pit. Uh, and then eventually they sell him into slavery in Egypt. And, and so it's rejection after rejection, trauma after trauma. And, um, and he gets this slave job um, and, and, and uh, in Potiphar's house. And he's doing awesome. He's doing great. Well, he gets uh, the Potiphar's wife, uh, you know, makes advances towards him. Joseph rejects it. But he, and in his rejection of her, of the advances, doing the right thing, he, he, he gets accused of raping her because Potiphar's wife's ticked that he won't give in to her advances and she accuses him of rape and of course Potiphar throws him in prison. And so he spends 10 to 13 years in prison uh, for something he didn't do, for doing the right thing, for, for not giving in. So he's falsely accused, which is one thing, but then he has to pay for it. So he's, Joseph has hit after hit after hit, but after a long season in prison there, he, God, he interprets a dream and, and, it, and God, in his timing, advances him to second in position of all of Egypt. It's an incredible favor. And so as we get to the end of the story is what we just read there, his brothers who, you know, he didn't, they didn't know he was alive and he didn't know they were alive and boom, they're reunited because Joseph is in charge and he has, there's a famine and he has access to all the food and they're coming asking for food. And so anyway, it's quite the amazing story. Please read it this week, but there's this cool theme that you see all through chapter 37 to 50 of Genesis that says, and the, the communication is basically God was with Joseph. The spirit of the Lord was on him. God was with him and, and there was favor. 
Yeah, it's this interesting theme that runs through the thread, even in the midst of all, even in the midst of the pit and prison and all the different seasons of difficulty, you see this theme of God was with him. And so you see his miraculous intervention happening. Now let's go to, let's go to verse 18 to 21. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and they said, behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in the place, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So we see here in verse 20, it's really like the summary of of what's happened in the story. He's basically saying, listen, I know that this was difficult and listen, but I see God's hand, his providential hand in this. He put me in Egypt for such a time like this, just like Esther. And he's like, I'm here to save many people. And I see God's hand. I know you meant evil against me. So he's not denying that they did evil against him, but he said, but God meant it for good. God can take the evil and he can bring good from it. And that's incredible. That's the good news that we don't have to stay stuck. Uh, No matter what our family of origins, what happened back there in our family of origin or our foo, (laughs) right? No matter what the poo in your foo, God can still use it. He can still use it. That's, that's, I, I don't know how God does that. It's, he's God, but he can, take the difficulty and the harsh stuff of the past and bring good out of it. And we're going to see that. And how does he do that? Well, when you and I come to Christ, right, the good news is we're not, we don't have to be stuck in that stuff. We, it, you you got to have the courage to go back and look at it. We're going to talk about that more. But we don't have to stay stuck. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, we can be born again, birthed into a new family, a new identity in Christ. Our identity is bigger than our biological family. <laughs> it, our biological family is great, and we need to honor our moms and our dads and our families. And Absolutely. It's important. It's key. It's very biblical. But we also get birthed into a new family, the family of God, because of what Jesus does. And we get a new identity, and it's rooted in the blood of Jesus. And when you put your faith in Christ, you get a new nature. You're reborn. You you get transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, right? We get a new heart, a new nature, a new name. We're now Christ followers. We're Christians. And and it's so incredible. And really, you could sum all the gospel up in the sense of our new our new position in Christ as we're adopted into the family of God. As a matter of fact, Romans 8, look at this, 14 to 15 on the screen. It says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, daddy, father, papa. Ah, So we're adopted in to God's family, you guys. And so no matter how wonderful or how difficult your family of origin is, important, key, right? It's God had a reason in that and a purpose in that, but we're also now adopted into the family of God. We're part of a bigger family, new brothers, new sisters in Christ, right? B fams and brothers from another mother, you know, like we, we have sisters from another sister. God is, he, we're, we're God's kids together. It's beautiful. And so And so part of this getting unstuck, though, as I mentioned to you earlier, is taking a look at that iceberg and and just pay attention to the 10% above the surface is really where we tend to spend most of our time. It's where it's the patterns, the things we do, the habits we have, the behavioral things we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But what drives so much of that really is what's below the surface. And one of the problems in Christianity has been many times we neglect the 90%. And God's inviting us down uh, below the surface. And part of that means going back and looking at our past, looking at our family of origin and saying, God, is there any noticeable patterns? Is there any noticeable things back there that that you want to change, that you want to redeem, that you want to bring wholeness and healing to? And and I could say it this way, that healthy discipleship is this, it's, it's putting off This is on the screen for you. Putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way in God's family. Let me read it to you again. Putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way in God's family. A really sticky way that Pete Scazzaro says it is this. Because now you're in Christ. He says, Jesus may live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, so you you can be saved and going to heaven, but yet our past impacts us, 
right? So, so really, what are we talking about? Well, being a healthy disciple of Jesus is getting Jesus in your bones as well, not just in your heart, but that he's that sanctification process that we're growing up fully, fully whole, fully free into all God has, right? Galatians 5.1 says about walking in freedom, it says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And I've mentioned this verse to you recently as well, but Hebrews 10.14 says, for by that one offering, what Jesus did and accomplished, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. So we're positioned in Christ as righteous and whole, yet we're being made holy holy, we're growing up, as I like to say, into who God already has made us to be. Part of that is looking back, going back in order to go forward. Now, I love this. So now, I, and I, well, I want to clarify something. What we're talking about today, this isn't parent bashing. This isn't family bashing. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an honest honoring. Because you can say I honor my parents, but a healthy honor requires honesty, not for the purpose of shame or blame, but for the purpose of wholeness. For the, for, to, to say, to say honestly, every one of us grows up in an imperfect family. Some of you had really pretty amazing family situations. Some of you had really difficult, dysfunctional families. No matter what, we're all in the sense of <laughs> between us and perfection, all of us are not close to perfection, none of us. And so, listen, there's no comparison here. This is just, hey, this was our history. This was our story, and God knows that, and he wants to bring greater freedom, greater wholeness for all of us, all right? So healthy honor requires honesty, and, and, and I just, we wanna honor, because here's what, here's what I do know about our families, is that I would say that 99% of families did the best they could with what they were given. <laughs> I'd, I'd say that 99%, but, but sometimes what we're given is broken, right? Most of the time it's broken. It's not perfect. And so people are trying to do the best they can most of the time, but what they got to work with really impacts. Remember, it's a generational challenge. It's a generational thing. And so the principle here is though, to, in order to go back, in order to go forward, you got to know and be aware of that stuff. So the principle is you can't change what you're unaware of. You can't change what you're unaware of. Right, and and as as you read the book from Pete Scazzaro, I want to encourage you to read the book. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a blue and white cover, the new version, the updated version. It's got an iceberg on the front. You just go go online and pick that up. And and I want to encourage you to get the book because there's great stories. But Pete. Scazzaro, the author, he writes about his family history and he says, listen, I came from a, he, he grew up in New York. He came from a family of Italian immigrants. And he says, when I looked at the patterns and the, the messages of my family, uh, he has a great list there of things to look at, but I'll just give you a few examples from him. He said, you know, in my family, there was a pattern of workahol we're workaholics. We were immigrant family. We came to America, uh, you know, and, and we had to work hard and make our way. And he goes, so the message, there's nothing wrong with being a hard worker, but to be a workaholic is different. Meaning you don't ever rest. You don't ever take a break. The message is work, 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 work. We're just, there's, there's a Sabbath for a reason. We're called, God calls us to take a break, right? Um, he said in his family, the, his dad was absent because of all that workaholism, workaholicism. Uh, he was, he was not emotionally available. He wasn't rarely available at all. He didn't spend much time with them. Uh, he said his grandfather was a womanizer and he had two separate families going hidden from each other. And so he was working the angle all the time. And so he had that in his history. And he said, you know, angry outbursts and threats to kill. Uh, you know, if you didn't behave, were, were thrown out, those kind of threats that are just harsh and extreme. There was an avoidance of resolving conflict. Uh, and, and certainly, as I mentioned, you don't take any rest. You don't take breaks. But listen, we're here to work and we got to make our way. And the message that got passed down was in order to be a son you're proud of, Pete said, you had to you work your tail off, never take a break, never take a vacation, whatever you do. And he said, so even when I gave my life to Christ and I became a Christ follower and Jesus was in my heart, he said, I had these messages in my bones. 
and it was impacting. And, and this, as I mentioned just last week to you, the story was his, they planted a church to him and his wife and his wife quit, comes to us one day and says, I'm going to quit your church because they're living without limits. There's this performance oriented and driven and no, no healthy boundaries, no healthy limits. That was just one of the things. And so uh, it's interesting about drivenness because I think many people can relate with the success drive or what's behind. There's nothing wrong with success and doing well and working hard. Absolutely. Those are all good, actually good things and biblical things, right? But I like, I like what this quote from Pete, he says, how many highly successful people are driven by deeply seated shame and a feeling of abandonment, silently crying out, notice me. What Pete says was, he says, I, I worked hard because I thought I'd get my dad's approval. I worked hard because that was the message and any positive attention I could get, that was the only way I thought I could get it. Yeah. So this intentional work that you and I are going to do below the surface in our past and, and we're going to, I just want to encourage you, the work you and I do today will help those who come after us in our family. Your kids, your grandkids, their, their families and their families and their sons. So, so it's not just for your freedom. Realize we're helping break old patterns and that's a big deal. Everybody's got their own choices to make along the process. But if you can set a positive pattern, a healthy biblical Christian pattern, right? And you're loving and, and you're a safe person and you're trusting and your communication is healthier. This really helps not only you, your friends, your family around you. Dan Siegel says this, and this is not on the screen, but if parents make sense of their story, it can totally change the outcome of the next generation. I really like that. But sometimes people are resistant to going back, and I get that too. But uh, I just want to say, you know, so there's a couple practical things we can do here. As a matter of fact, uh, I mentioned to you some of the messages from the past, or even I think I threw the word out, earthquake events. Uh, before I get to those earthquake events, let me just share some of the messages that Pete Scazzaro mentions that were uh, in his family. Like, for instance, in the area of money, uh, he said one of the things about money was the more money you have, the more important you are. That was a message in his family. That's an unhealthy message. Uh, in the area of conflict, avoid conflict at all costs. <laughs> okay. In the area of grief and loss, sadness is a sign of weakness. Don't be sad. Be happy. Right? Is there anything wrong with happiness? No. But to say you should never be sad, there are appropriate times to be sad. Yeah. Um, in, in the area of family, duty to family and culture comes before everything. Really? In relationships, don't trust people. They will let you down. Nobody will ever hurt me again. Don't show vulnerability. <laughs> Those messages I've heard repeated with people around me many times. Don't trust people. And, you're, and sometimes you have good reason to because people do let you down and people do uh, uh, sometimes give you away when you share something. And so those messages can uh, reinforce lies like this, unhealthy messages, right? Another message, how about certain cultures and races are not as good as mine? So racism and, and sexism can, can creep in there and those messages can be in our families, even subtly and even sometimes blatantly, and sometimes we don't even realize it because we just grow up in it, right? You're not allowed to have certain feelings <laughs> about emotions and feelings. Don't feel that, right? So it could go on, but, but I, you, you can see there's these messages. And as you and I begin to reflect on our, our, our mom and our dad or those who we grew up with, and then maybe our grandparents and their parents, and as we start kind of looking at the, pa the patterns and noticing, we're just prayerfully saying, God, help us see those things. Help us discover those things so that we can bring them to you and those that aren't aligned with truth or those that are messed up that God, we would walk in a healthier message, a, a biblical message, right? So it's key, but it takes courage to do this. It does. And, and I mentioned to you these messages, but also these family messages, but then also there's these earthquake events. And what is that? Well, it's an event that has a lasting effect on your mental or emotional health. I think that's on the screen for an earthquake event, or, or it, we could even call it a trauma, really. It's, it's an event that has a lasting effect on your mental, emotional health. I mean, these things could be could be divorces, could have been a sudden loss in your family. It could be uh, uh, capital T trauma, some kind of sexual abuse, some kind of abuse of any form, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Um, th but these traumas, these earthquake events, can, they shake us, they, they impact us. 
And, and God wants to bring wholeness and healing in those areas. As a matter of fact, when we go back to the story of Joseph, we look, there was at least three traumas that he experienced. He was betrayed by his brothers. That's the first one. And, you know, his brothers were jealous. He was daddy's favorite. He was young and immature. He, he tells them, hey, you're going to bow down to me, as I mentioned. And they throw him in a hundred foot deep cistern, dark, damp, uh, awful, uh, alone, abandoned, rejected by your own family. I mean, talk about a recipe for trauma. That's one. That is an earthquake event, right? And so then, third, secondly, he's, so, he's, so he's betrayed by his brothers, but then secondly, he's sold into slavery, and these Egyptian merchants come by, and they, they sell him for two years' wages. And, uh, you know, so now you know that your brothers not only betray you, but they sell you. So this is the first instance of human trafficking mentioned in the Bible. Uh, this is, he was a teenager. I mean, this is like the ultimate wounding. I mean, two back to back, betrayed, then sold into slavery, human, human trafficked, and then for over a decade lost in prison, lost in, for a decade in prison, as I mentioned to you earlier. So, and, and so as a matter of fact, when you look at Genesis 39, six to seven, it says Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. So that's, see, and so Potiphar's wife, she gets, she gets a good look at Joseph. It's like, I want that guy. I want that guy. But it says, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully, come and sleep with me, she demanded. But we know, as I mentioned to you earlier, Joseph's integrity in his, in his value of who God is and who God is in his life. He's like, no, I'm not going to do this. And it would be against I, God, Potiphar, my master, put me in charge of all this. And I'm going to, you know, it would be wrong. It's the wrong thing. And, but again, it gets him thrown in prison and it's awful. And so not only is he carrying the heavy baggage of, of betrayal and human, human trafficking and total rejection from his family and distance and not knowing whether his, the rest of his family is alive and having no communication with them. I mean, it's the ultimate separation. It's, it's abandonment. It's, it's so many things mixed in. He's then wrongly accused and he spends over 10 years. I can't help but think in that time, he must have had some questions of God. But it, it's incredible what the Bible says. It, it, he just did the best with his circumstances. And it shows, it says in there that God's favor was on him and, and, and he rose up even in prison to become in charge of the prison. It's like he did the best with the gifts God gave him and the circumstances God gave him. He, he didn't let it take him out. He let it, he, he, he said, God help. And it was incredible. And so when we look at this, this story of Joseph, there's some practical things we can really learn from him that I think uh, we could apply to our lives to heal some hurts and, and walk in greater freedom. And I think the first thing we could learn practically is this. We need to trust that God is guiding your life or our lives. That we need to trust that God's in charge, that he's leading. Now, as, as I mentioned, Genesis repeats this phrase, and it comes from 39.21. Look at it. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. That's in the, that scene about the, when he's in prison. So he rises up in prison, as I just mentioned. But it's this part here where it says the Lord was with Joseph and showed him his faithful love. So, so Joseph sees that. He picks up on that, and it's clearly there in the story. And so whether he was in the pit or in the worst situation, God was there. He was showing him favor. And you might go, so did God cause all these harsh, extremely harsh things to happen? I don't believe God causes the catastrophes in our lives, but I do believe he knows about them and he uses them and he brings good from them, right? And, and so he uses the difficulty. He uses the trauma. I don't believe God caused the trauma, but he'll use it and direct it. And we see that he does that because we know the end of the story. I read it to you earlier that God caused the, this, this path, these things and he, he caused the difficulty and the trauma to lead to a place where he rescued his people, the Israelites, and the family uh, lineage right there of, of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and the 12 sons to keep them alive 
because Joseph is now in charge of all the food of Egypt. And that's where, and there was, because of that dream he interpreted in prison, he was able to store up grain for years and years and years for the, through the famine and had enough to feed not only their own people of Egypt, but beyond. And he's able to sell that and give that to the family. And anyway, the, the, many people are saved because of Joseph, but God was, Joseph looked at what God was doing and could see it. He had a perspective that was bigger than the circumstances at the time. When he's looking back, he's going, listen, I know you meant evil against me, but God has used it to save many people alive. God brought good from it. And so that's encouraging. And I think for you and I, practically, if we just go, God, when I look at my history, when I look at my past, there's difficulty, there's trauma, there's messages that aren't healthy, but God, I'm trusting that you are the redeemer. You are the one who can take even harsh, difficult, things and somehow bring good from it. The little <laughs> way I say it, the cliche way is God can make mosaics, beautiful things out of messes. Mosaics are usually made of broken pieces of things coming together to make something beautiful. Ah, love it. So first of all, trust God is guiding your life. Secondly, uh, grieve your losses grieve your losses. We see, and I'm not going to read it to you, but in, in chapter 50 there of Genesis in, in 15 to 21, his brothers bow before him. They, they, their dad has died and they come before him and, and they're basically, they're, they're kind of trying to be deceive, deceitful and like, well, hey, dad, before he died said, please forgive us for all the bad stuff. Cause they're like, is he going to take revenge on us? Is he going to kill us? We know he has all this power. They're scared. They're freaked out. Anyway, and that's where he says, listen, I know you guys meant evil against me. So he's not acting like they didn't do anything wrong. He's not denying it. He's not sweeping it under the rug. He's like, you did, you did evil against me, but I can see a bigger, uh, there's a bigger story that God had here. And he's using and has used this to bring me to a place where he's going to save his people. And, and he's saving you and I'm here for you. And there's a, then a moment of forgiveness there that happens. There's this honesty that happens. It says that, that he wept, Joseph wept. And, it, and there's a point in there in those chapters where he doesn't just cry a little bit. He weeps so hard that the Egyptians hear it. So it was a snot bubbling, weeping, incredible thing. So I believe he's feeling the grief. He's feeling the loss. And that's important to do that, to feel it. But yet there's a moment of reconciliation, a moment of healing here. And, and it's beautiful what God does. And so we need to grieve our losses. We need to trust God's guiding, even in the midst of all the hard stuff, the blessings and the difficulties. We need to grieve our losses, you guys. We need to really do them. And it takes patience, 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 patience. It takes time. And then thirdly, we need to transform family pain with forgiveness. Look at verses 19, transform family pain with forgiveness. It says, uh, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in the place for am I in the place of God? Question mark. No, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore do not be afraid. Uh, I will provide for you and your little ones and the, and they, and he comforted them and spoke kindly to him. So we see, as I mentioned, that forgiveness. And you guys, that's where it starts. It starts with first identifying and being aware of the things that need to be processed and worked through and who needs to be forgiven. And then God will, with, by God's grace, you need to ask him, God, give me grace to forgive, to not hold on to people that have hurt me, but to release them into your hands. And that's part of it. And that's what Joseph did here. He, he released them. He had a bigger picture God had been doing. He'd gr grieve the loss of his relationship with his brothers and his family for all these years because he saw God's hand doing something bigger than even that hurt and pain. But yet he wanted to feel it. He needed to feel it. He weeps and processes through it with God. And I believe he extends that forgiveness. And so, so to wrap this up, I, I, I want to challenge you to get that book by Pete Scazzaro, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and read it. It's a pretty easy read, but it will it will bring you through some practicals of what you need to do. And and I'm going to include in the in the notes today uh, just some homework. And, and basically, what it is is it's going to be you uh, looking at the family messages. You know, mom, dad, or those that you grew up with might be grandpa and grandma, might be those caretakers, any other caretakers in your life. And then, so you're making a list of what was the messages in the family and what was the messages about money? What was the message about relationships? What, what do I notice? And just ask God to help you and show you and write those things down. And then, then what are those 
say, God, what are those earthquake events, those real turning point events, or those really challenging events? Might be uh, uppercase T trauma, might be lowercase T trauma. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the trauma is neglect. Sometimes it's just someone wasn't around that should have been around. It can be that. I, I call that a lowercase T trauma. Um, but those are, those, are mean, those are powerful things. There might have been a sudden loss of a, a child or a parent. Or it, Write those things down. Notice those things. And because they all begin a process of then inviting God into that situation and journaling through what God's doing in that and how he wants to bring wholeness and healing and forgiveness in that. So let me pray for you. Jesus, I ask, Lord, for those who are tuning in today that you would help them. Lord, I believe, Holy Spirit, you're working. You're working below the surface. You're helping us be willing and aware of the things in the iceberg below the surface of our lives. And God, you want to take what's in the past and bring it into the light and then help us uh, bring, have you bring healing and wholeness because of what you've done, Jesus Christ, in our lives. Jesus, you've accomplished we can be free fully and we can stop sinful behavior and sinful patterns and they can be done in Jesus name. And so I'm asking Lord, even as people are tuning in Lord, that you Holy Spirit have put on uh, some of their minds, people to forgive. Would they walk in forgiveness? I pray they would make those things right with those they need to. If they're still alive, if they're not alive, they'd still forgive Lord. they wouldn't be holding on even for those who've gone uh, in our past Lord, that they would forgive as well. Lord bless those who are tuning in. And if, you, if you're here tuning in and you've never said yes to Jesus, I wanna encourage you to, to just receive his love, receive his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his salvation, right? Because that's where it starts. You can't bring, let God go back and have it. You can't be a part of a new family in Christ without saying yes to the gift he offers that he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection on that cross. So if you want that, say yes to him today and, and just say yes to him right now, Jesus. I want that. I say yes to you. I receive your salvation, forgiveness. I want to begin a new life with you, adopted into your family in this day. This day, this day, I, I mark it as the day I said yes to you and I begin a journey with you. Ah, so grateful. Love you, Jesus. Amen. I love you. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. We are so grateful for the Word of God and thrilled that you joined us today. We hope you experience God's presence and will continue to experience Him throughout this week. If this was your first time with us, please text RCC New to 9730. So that's 000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus, we are so excited. Please, we want to know more. So text us also RCC Life at 97000. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Have a great week.